Good morning. It's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's Word. This morning we're going to focus on our epistle reading, which comes to us from Hebrews chapter 10. Uh, We begin by singing our opening hymn number 516, Wake, Awake, for Night is Flying. We turn to page 219 for the order of matins. Please stand.
O Lord, open my lips. Make haste, O God, to deliver me. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Blessed be God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our psalm of the day is Psalm 16, which you can find in the front part of your hymnal. Please note there are no page numbers. The psalms are simply in numerical order. And we read responsively half verse by half verse, Psalm 16. If that sounds strange to you, that means I read up to the red asterisk, and you will respond with the rest of the verse. We read responsibly Psalm 16. Preserve me, O God. I say to the Lord, you are my Lord. As for the saints in the land, The sorrows of those who run after another god shall multiply. The Lord is my chosen portion and my cup. The lines have fallen for me in pleasant places. I bless the Lord who gives me counsel. I have set the Lord always before me. Therefore my heart is glad and my whole being rejoices. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol. You make known to me the path of life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, 
and will be forever. Amen. Please be seated. I now invite any children forward for a special message. Good morning, boys and girls. Let's try this again. Good morning. All right. Uh, who here washes? Oh, come on up, Eli. Who here washes their hands? Sometimes. Yeah. Sometimes. Why do you wash your hands? Patrick? Okay, to get all the bacteria off your hands. Why else do you wash your hands, Ryan? So they can stay clean or to make them clean, right? Um, when you wash your hands, what do you use? Soap and water. Yeah. Well, oh, hand sanitizer? Okay. Um, you know, hand sanitizer isn't very good for getting dirt off your hands, right? Yeah. But what if you got paint on your hands? What would you use to wash your hands then, Ryan? Soap and water? Well, if you have an oil-based paint, soap and water don't work very well. Patrick? That's <laughs> this hot water and soap, same as soap and water. No. Uh, Eli? Paint thinner. Yeah, at least I use paint thinner to get the paint off my hands. And there are other different products that you can use as well to wash things off of your hands when soap and water don't work well. Well, sometimes we need something else to wash our, off our hands. But it isn't the dirt you can see, because sometimes we use our hands to hit people. Sometimes we push people with them. Sometimes we use our hands to make fun of people. Sometimes our hands don't do what they're supposed to do. Sometimes our hands color or paint or draw on things that aren't supposed to be color or painted or drawn on. Now this happens because we are all sinners. Our hands make mistakes and we need to clean our hands off. And we need to clean our whole life. But soap and water doesn't wash away our sins. Our epistle reading for today tells us there's something special that washes our hands and all of our sins away. The blood of Jesus washes our sins away. And the great thing is when Jesus shed his blood on the cross, he washes all our sins away for good. And Hebrews tells us that God will remember our sins no more. In other words, our hands, our whole selves, have been washed clean forever. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you for sending Jesus to die on the cross to shed his blood on to shed his blood for us so that our sins could be washed away for good. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. All right, thanks boys and girls, you return to your seats or you can follow Mr. Anaker to Kids Church. We continue our worship by singing our next hymn, hymn number 508. The day is surely drawing near.
Our Old Testament reading for the 25th Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from the book of Daniel, chapter 12, the first three verses, on page 956 in your pew Bibles. And our Old Testament reading reminds us that a time of unrest and great spiritual warfare is still to come. But we need not fret, because through our faith we know that we are written in the book of life and will one day shine like the stars. We read, At that time shall arise Michael, the great prince who is charge of our people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never has been since there was a nation till that time. But at that time your people shall be delivered, everyone whose name shall be found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. O Lord, have mercy on us. Our epistle reading comes to us from Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 25, beginning on page 1290. And our reading reminds us that we shouldn't give up meeting together because we have a great high priest who by a single offering has perfected all who are being sanctified. For God promises to forget our sins. We read, And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the Holy Spirit also bears witness to us. For after saying, This is the covenant that I will make with them, after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my laws on their hearts and write them on their minds. Then he adds, I will remember their sin and their lawless deeds no more. Where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance and faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. O Lord, have mercy on us. Please stand for the Gospel reading. And the Holy Gospel is according to St. Mark, the 13th chapter, the first 13 verses on page 1086. And our Gospel reading begins with the disciples marveling at the temple stones and architecture. But Jesus reminds them that one day, these stones will fall. But it must happen. But when it does, it won't be the end yet. But the end is getting closer and closer. We read. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, Do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, Tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, See that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name, saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumor of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet. For a nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. 
Be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues. And you will stand before governors and kings for my sake, to bear witness before them. And the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations. And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father, his child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death. And you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved. O Lord, have mercy on us. We turn to page 221 in our hymnal for the common responsory. Forever, O Lord, your word is firmly set in the heavens. Blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. What do you think you're doing here today? Who are you to come into such a holy place as this? How do you think that your voice can join the heavenly chorus of angels praising and honoring God? I mean, on this altar, the Holy God comes to us body and blood in the bread and wine. And who are you to even draw near to this holy altar of God? Or how can you thank this baptismal font that the Holy Spirit of the triune God would even consider coming to you and dwelling inside of you? Who are you to come and sit in these pews while God's holy and true word is proclaimed from that lectern and from this pulpit? I mean, these are the holy things of God in God's holy house where he promises to be present. So I ask again, how can you come into such a holy place like this? And you don't just come in here with fear and trembling. You walk through our doors with confidence. And even our epistle reading says so. Since we have confidence to enter the holy places. And a little later, Hebrew says, let us draw near with a true heart. But how do you have confidence to approach this altar? How can you draw near with a true heart? After all, your heart has those awful, filthy thoughts. You have spoken badly about someone behind their backs, maybe even in these very pews, or maybe in our choir itself. Or maybe even about one of our church workers. You have grumbled that so-and-so isn't good enough or is too rotten and yet you don't even recognize the plank in your own eye. How can you, such a sinner, enter such a holy place with confidence? How can you laugh with high delight as you walk under our archway to find your seat? Especially after you laughed after, at that racist joke or that dirty joke this past week. For here you come in contact with the holy triune God who hates sin and wickedness. How can you just idly chat with the person in front of you when you know your true self doesn't deserve to be in God's holy house? 
when you know that the desires of your heart aren't always pure? How can you speak God's word when this past week you spoke those words you know you shouldn't have? How can you come into God's holy house when last week you said, I, a poor, miserable sinner, and you know what, God, I'm not going to do it again. But then this past week you were Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. Shouldn't God be tired of this facade? Hasn't he had enough of your pretending to be holier than you really are? How can anyone, pastor, organist, acolytes, young, old, man or woman, sit in these pews or even watch on our live stream and think, you know what, it's okay for me to be here today. Well, Hebrew tells us why. For the temporary problem of the Old Covenant was that the priests, they were just like regular ordinary people, full of sin and broken hearts. They weren't any better than the lay people or the ordinary people. So they had to repeatedly offer the same sacrifice for sins, over and over again. But now, now you have a great high priest who has offered a single sacrifice for sins once for all time. And this high priest now sits at the right hand of God, and this great high priest is Jesus. And Hebrews tells us, For by a single offering he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. Now, I like to think to myself during my opening rant that my opening rant that you were all sitting here saying to yourself, Pastor, I'm here because of the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. Because that's really why you're able to enter this building today and to be in God's holy presence. Because Jesus came to shed his blood on the cross for you once for all time, so that all your sins, all your shortcomings, all your backstabbing, all your bad words, all your sinfulness can be forgiven. So that you can approach the holy throne of grace, so you can approach his altar, bring your children to the baptismal font, sit in these pews and listen to God's holy and precious words without fear and trembling. Because Jesus' sacrifice was good enough. It forgives you. It removes your guilt. It takes away those sins you confessed this last week, and it takes away the sins you committed this week. And this gospel message is an amazing message. It's the reason why we should not neglect meeting together as the habit of some, but encourage one another. And this is why you're still here to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. The best news you will ever hear, ever, for all time. But I've just scratched the surface with you. I want you to consider something that, you know, blows my mind away when I stop and think about it. Now, one of the things that Christians, all Christians claim, is that God is omniscient. God is all-knowing. He knows everything. He knows when you wake up. He knows when you go to bed. He knows when the bird falls from the sky. He knows the very hairs on your head are numbered. And he has every one of them counted out for us. God knows everything. He is omniscient. But what does it mean? When Hebrews quotes Jeremiah 31, I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. Doesn't that mean that God will no longer remember your sins? Doesn't that mean that God no longer knows something? And if there is something that God no longer knows, can we still say he is all-knowing? Is he omniscient if he forgets your sins? When it is said that God put everything on the line for you in the person of Jesus Christ, it means he put everything. Even the very things that God says about himself. 
His omniscient was on the line for you. In fact, he's almost saying to you today, if it means I can't be omniscient anymore because I choose to forget your sins, then so be it. That's how much I truly love you. I'm willing to forget your sins for good. I'm able to forget your past because of what my son Jesus did on the cross for you. And doesn't that kind of blow your mind or make you think at least a little? That in the gospel of Jesus Christ, God is basically saying he doesn't know your sins. He's saying he doesn't know something. The good news is that the sins you did this past week, you don't need Jesus to die on the cross for them again. They're already forgiven and forgotten by God. And it is amazing. That includes those sins you can't forget. Those mistakes that you feel you made that changed your life permanently. There are those sins that, that others that you just can't forgive. And there are those daily struggles that just don't seem to go away from you. As hard as you try, you try to forget sins, but you can't. You aren't able to forget all of them, especially the ones that people have sinned against you. But God, the omniscient, all-knowing God, amazingly can and does forget. God is forgiving you. He has already forgotten those past mistakes this week. He is forgiving you those things you can't forget. Those life-altering mistakes that you, you can't shake. God's already forgotten them about them for you for good. And instead of remembering your mistakes, he remembers his son Jesus' blood shed for you. He remembers those words, I forgive you. He sees you as his precious and holy child. He remembers you for who he has made you to be. A sanctified, forgiven child of God. And that ultimately is why, yes, you can be in such a holy place. Because God remembers your sins and your lawless deeds no more. That's why you can confidently stride through our doors, gather together, chuckle together, and hold fast to this important confession of faith. Because God has forgotten those sins, even the ones that still haunt you. Because God, for your sake, is willing to not know your mistakes. He's willing to not know something and he's willing to forget them forever because of Jesus. Also that one day you can confidently walk into an even holier place than this. That holy, heavenly place not made with human hands, but a place that one day you will confidently walk into just as if you were walking through the doors of Trinity Lutheran Church. But in that perfect and holy place, You'll get to be there forever. In the name of Jesus. Amen. We now continue our worship by singing our next hymn, hymn number 564, Christ Sits at God's Right Hand.
We turn to the back cover as we confess together the Apostles' Creed. We confess, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated for our offering. We are going to begin to sing the Te Deum on our services when we do matins. Today we have our choir here to sing the Te Deum so that we can become familiar with it. And if you'd like to follow along or join them along, we turn to page 223 with the Te Deum. Please stand.
we continue our worship with our prayers. We pray for those uh, listed in our bulletin. We also pray for Eileen Rainey, who was hospitalized this past week. And we pray for the family of Paul Nelson, that is John Rogie's son-in-law, who had passed away this past week. We continue with the Kyrie. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. O Lord, by your bountiful goodness, release us from the bonds of our sins, which by reason of our weakness we have brought upon ourselves, that we may stand firm until the day of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. We thank you, O Lord, our God and Father, for all your goodness. We praise you especially for the everlasting covenant you have made with us through the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. Grant that every good work we do would be pleasing in your sight for his sake. Lord, in your mercy, preserve your church throughout the world and keep us ready at all times for your Son's glorious return. Lead us to proclaim with zeal his coming to the ends of the earth. Lord, in your mercy, Bless all pastors and missionary ministers, that they may preach the pure doctrine of God's saving word, which will never pass away. Give faith to all who hear, that in Christ they may have the peace that passes all understanding. Lord, in your mercy. Uphold all in authority, especially Joe the President and Congress of the United States, Tony the Governor and Legislature of this state, and all judges. Graciously enable them to lead according to your will and for our good. Especially guide our military personnel and help us to honor our veterans. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks, Holy Lord, for the fruits of the earth provided by your hand. Supply the needs of all who grow, process, and distribute our food. And move us to share these bountiful gifts with our neighbors in their time of need. Lord, in your mercy. Behold the sick and infirm the dying and all in need, especially Eileen, Lois, Marcy, Myron, Larry, Helen, Jerry, Ken, Shirley, Mary, Bridge, Marion, Joel, and Iona. Grant them healing of body and patience to endure this affliction. We especially pray that your peace would surround the family of Paul. Lord, in your mercy. Guide Trinity Lutheran School with your grace and mercy so that we can teach the eternal truth to our students and family. Lord, in your mercy. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, you have safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings be ordered by your governance may be righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Let us bless the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. We remain standing for our closing hymn, 920.
Please be seated. Well, it's good to see each and every one of you here this morning as we gather around God's word as we're reminded that we enter God's holy place by the blood of Jesus shed on the cross for all of us. Um, a couple of announcements. Next week, our Team Trinity event, we're going to be playing sardines again by the request of one of our youth. But instead of 3 o'clock, we're going to start at 4.30 and go till 5.30. Um, so that's next Sunday. We have our cookie walk coming up fast. Um, you re we are now less than a month away from the cookie walk on December 11th. So there's plenty of choices out there that we can still use people to help uh, bake cookies. And if you don't bake cookies, come and buy some cookies on the Saturday, December 11th. Uh, any other announcements? None? Then let's conclude with the Bible verse of the month. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. God's blessings to you this week.